Thanks for the worship. I want you to turn to Matthew 13. We're continuing with the uh, study of the uh, wheat and the tares, and we're going to read again tonight uh, what we read last uh, Saturday, which is uh, verse 37 uh, down through verse 43. And we're specifically interested in verse uh, 41 um, in our investigation tonight. So, the wheat and the tares is a phenomenal parable. It's the second parable that Jesus tells uh, from Matthew's perspective. And you'll remember that as you move into this, uh, what we've got going on in chapter 13 is a change in style of uh, ministry. And Jesus has begun to speak to them in parables, and he's never done that before. Disciples have asked him why, and he says it's simply because they don't get it, and I want them to get it. I desire for them to get it, but they're not getting it. So everything I've said in terms of theology and reason and logic and, and uh, all of those kinds of approaches have not communicated to them, so I'm going to start telling them stories. And these stories will embed themselves in their mind and heart, and God will be able to reveal it to them as uh, in times later. So he tells these parables. Uh, second one is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, and the explanation is given to us in verse 37. So there's no need to uh, struggle to know what this means. For Jesus explains it. And here's the explanation, verse 37. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out of his angels, send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we got ears, where will, will we hear? And I guess that comes down to me, doesn't it? And my own choice and my openness to you and Am I willing and will I receive and will I let you do in my life what you want to do? And Lord, in the midst of all of my doubts and fears and uh, hesitations, would you break through in upon me and every one of us here tonight? And would you just reveal yourself? And Lord, while we don't know everything, we do know something. And I want to respond on what I do know. And I want to be listening, hearing to the largest capacity that I have. So, Jesus, speak, and I will obey. I will respond. Um, don't let me miss it. Please, in your name I pray. Amen. It's an interesting thing about the wheat and the tares parable and especially the, uh, the, the overall, the explanation that he gives that I'd like to uh, begin by giving you uh, an overall view of the parable itself. And it seems to me the reason that's so important is because every decision you make, that is, that is every explanation you give, everything that you glean out of this parable will come because of your view of this overall view because he's trying to say something in a broad way, and when you bring it down to the narrow, uh, you have to see the broad in order to understand the narrow. And as you look at the overall parable, one of the things, there's several things that are important, and I want to list them for you. One is the long range. It's interesting that in the parable, he gives a complete history of the human life. In other words, the parable is taking us basically from the creation of man in, in, by, Ad, uh, by God in, uh, in the garden, Adam and Eve, all the way through to the climax of the age, which is Jesus coming again, and everything in between. So this little parable covers a lot of history, folks, 
because it's the whole span of human existence that he's referring to. In other words, it's a long-range view. And that's really important, I think, because your decisions and my decisions really need to be made in light of the long-range view. And I know how difficult that is. I, I absolutely do. Because things press in upon you, you know, and, and trouble takes place. Ah, and you got problems you got to solve, yeah. And there's a sewage problem, yeah, you got to handle that. And then you got the car problem, and then you got, oh, man. And then uh, Sean gives me a call, and oh, brother. And, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. And so all is immediate right here, this very moment, how am I going to, what am I going to do? Well, wouldn't it be interesting if you made all your decisions in light of not today, not tomorrow, but 50 years? What are you going to be and where are you going to be in 50 years from now? And when you look at it in the long range, in the big view, this isn't so big. <laughs> this isn't so, such a great crisis when you look at it in the long range. And ladies and gentlemen, if you do not have a long range view and make decisions in light of that which is coming and that which is where you're going and that which in which you want to be, you will never get anywhere. You will stay as you are. So I want to encourage you to drag every decision and everything you think and all that is developing in your life I want to encourage you to drag it in and see it in light of the long range. Where, what's going to happen to you in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Of course, I'll be dead, so I won't care. <laughs> you know, sin doesn't really make any sense. And when you sit down at a table and you logically lay it out, sin and all of its destructiveness and what it's done to your life and my life doesn't make any sense. I mean, logically, you would set the whole thing aside and say, that's not the direction to go. This is the direction to go when you logically think it out. But again, see, the trick of the devil is he camouflages and we never get into the long-range view and the planning and designing of our life in light of that long-range view. And I think one of the things that's going on in the parable is Jesus is trying to get us to see that. See, how will the decision I make now affect my life for 30 years? How will the decision I make now affect my unborn kids? How will the decision I make now affect my grandkids? How will the decision I make now, how will what I am becoming, what's going on in my life in this moment, affect? Isn't that important? That's the parable. Now, in light of that, another thing that he brings up in the overall view of the parable, not only the long range, but the last reaping. And I know you reap as you go along. There's no question about that. And I do this, and therefore I bear the consequences of that. I got that. And the Bible does say you reap what you sow, and I understand that because I've done that in my own life. So I, I know there's a continual reaping going on. But in the parable, there is a final reaping that takes place. In other words, this is all going to be wrapped up. And he says in verse 39, the enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the word age there is eons, which was kind of interesting to me as because we studied this a few weeks ago. The idea of eternity, that's translated eternity or eternal in other places. And it's interesting to me that the word has the idea of a time bracket, a period of existence. In other words, life doesn't cease. It's we live in a time bracket period of existence right now. That is going to come to an end, and we are going to start another time period. Well, period of existence at least, called eternity. So here's a period of time a period of existence, then there's another period of existence. So it's the idea is in the parable that we're moving from one period of existence into another period of existence, and you understand what's going to happen in this period of existence is going to be determined by where we end up in this period of existence, which becomes, again, significant in the parable. So if you grab a hold of what he's really trying to say to us, 
there is going to be a final harvest. So if you put all that together, what I need to have in my life, in my decision-making, in what I do on a daily basis must come under the auspices, the control of a long-range view. Where am I going? Where am I headed? Because this thing is all going to be wrapped up in a final hour. Now, I know that sounds like preacher stuff because I've heard that all my life as well. But when you're in the crisis of today, we lose sight of the long range. And uh, so I want to encourage you. Think it through, would you? Now, another thing that's all wrapped up in the, in the overall view, not only the long range, not only the last reaping, but there is the lawlessness is removed. And that's something of what we're going to deal with tonight because in verse 41, look at this thing. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Now, those who practice lawlessness, according to verse 38, are the sons of the wicked ones, which, of course, are the tares. The tares are going to be removed. That's the parable. That there's going to come an hour when the Son of Man, Jesus, will send out his angels, they will go out and gather out all the tares, and the tares, the sons of the wicked one, will all be removed. And you understand it isn't, it isn't just the sons of the wicked one which seems to be the problem. It's all the wickedness itself. How can I explain that to you? See, it doesn't have anything to do with personalities. See, God is not against, well, there's John, and he's been bad, and I hate him. See, you don't find anything like that in the parable. You find no anger, and we've gone over this. You find no, God isn't ticked off. God isn't say, I've had it. They've done one thing too much. Oh, I can't stand him anymore. See, that's the way we are. God isn't that way, people. Are you hearing me? God is not that way. It's just that everything has grown to a completion, and here we are at the end of this time period. And things are wrapped up. And what has it come to? It's come to, I'm going to remove everything that's not of the nature and heart of God is going to be removed. And what that's going to do is that's going to turn, all the wheat is going to be turned loose and everything that has hampered them in terms of tares is going to be removed, and everything, you do realize we're under the curse of sin, right? And the reason you have to work by the sweat of your brow is because of Adam and Eve. And you realize that Paul said the whole earth groans, groans. And every time I put a shovel in the ground this week and, and hit a rock in the digging for a septic tank and sewer, I just... Whoa, this earth is cursed. <laughs> and it is. And can you imagine when all of that is gone and there is no sin anymore and the curse is removed and whoa, no wonder, he says in verse 30, 43, the, the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father that things are going to be turned loose. Why? Because there's going to be a removal of everything that's lawless. Now, can you imagine giving your whole life to lawlessness and, and coming up at the end finding out, oh, brother, that's all going to go away. I gave my life for that which is all going to be destructive. So wouldn't you want to wear yourself out? Wouldn't you want to work yourself into a heart attack? Wouldn't you want to just give your, all your energy to that which is going to go on forever and ever and ever and ever? Not that which is... That's the parable. So what is he saying? He's saying, guys, what I want you to do is I want you to get the long-range view. I want you to see this wow, what am, what am I going to be 50 years from now? What am I going to be 30 years from now? Where am I headed? What, not, don't get so wrapped up in now and solving this immediate problem that you don't see this in light of where you are going and what really matters 
And keep in mind in this long-range view, there's going to be a wrap-up of this whole thing, and this is simply a time bracket, and we're going to move into a whole new time, a whole new period of existence. And keep in mind everything that's involved in evil and wickedness and sin and all that's not right here is going to be removed, and I don't want to give one ounce of my energy to that. I want to give everything I've got to that which is going to last forever. That's the parable. There's a fourth overall view. It's not only the long range and the last reaping and the lawlessness removed, but love related. And this this is so impressive to me. And again, we've, we've talked about it, but it just needs to be emphasized again and again and again. The owner of the field, who is the prime mover in this whole thing, which is obviously God, And the wheat, the one who plants the wheat is the son of man, which is Jesus. So we're talking the Trinity God here who is the prime mover of the whole parable loves the wheat. He does. He dreamed the wheat into existence. He planted the wheat. He cultivated the wheat. He watered the wheat. And when their tares showed up, he told the servant, don't touch the tares or the wheat because you might mess up my wheat. Leave them alone. And he protected the wheat because he loves the wheat. And you know why he's removing the tares? Not because he's mad at tares. The reason he's removing the tares is because he loves the wheat. (laughs) And the wheat are in the destructive mode towards the tares. The tares are in the destructive mode towards the wheat. And he loves the wheat. So he's removing all the tares so the wheat can be turned loose to be all that these dreamed they could be because he just plain flat loves the wheat. And at the heart of God, there is this, this passionate Let's see, all of this in the parable is driven not by hate, not by I'm mad, not by I'm ticked off, not by I'm a judging God. Everything in the parable is driven by this passionate love heart of a God who loves the wheat. That's the parable. So put all this together. What do you got? You got this long-range view. Don't make a decision now. Don't don't live today. Oh, live today, but live today in light of where you're going and what's going to matter 100 years from now. Don't just live reactive for the moment. Live in the flow of something bigger, the long-range view. Because there's going to be a wrap-up of this time period and we're going to move into another period of existence and this is all going to be wrapped up. And when this is all wrapped up, what's going to happen is lawlessness, everything that's evil, is going to be removed. Not because God is mad, but because he's a passionate, loving God who wants to turn the wheat loose and build them into all these dreams they could be. I want to be in on that, man. I want to be in on that. Wow. I enjoyed that. Okay, so in light of that, we are discussing the tares. The tares. Now, we started uh, last week by talking about who they are, uh, what exactly is involved in them. And we started uh, on the first idea which was the property, meaning the content. What is the content of the tear? And we ended up in verse 41 uh, to explain that to you where it says, he gathered out of his kingdom all things that offend. So the content of the tares is offense. That's the content according to what he says. They are constantly offending, which was an interesting thing. We broke that down into three ideas. One is a state, the state of the tear, which is it's not, nothing is listed about what he does. 
So this is not about action. Oh, he drank too much or oh, he was on drugs or oh, he swore too much. or not, It wasn't any of that. didn't have anything to do with what he did. It was a state of existence of who he is. In other words, don't spend your time all wrapped up in what you do. S- worry about who you are, which is the real issue of the parable. And we moved on from the state of, of poison to the... S- sequel of others in other words what really is going on is that the and this is so interesting in relationship to the parable that all that's going on in the tear is not about the tear it's about affecting others in other words the word offend is the greek word scandalon which we discovered was a stick in a death trap and it's all about how and how you affect others So sin is not about what's going on in you only. It's about how it's influencing and definitely destroying those around you, which is the whole emphasis of the parable as well. Tonight I want to talk to you about the next statement in verse 41, and it says, those who practice lawlessness. Back up, read the whole thing. The Son of Man will send out His angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice. Now, you may have a different translation, and it may say act. It may say do. There are other translations, I understand. But the Greek word is the word, wait for it, poieo. And if you've been around us very long, that word just shows up all the time. Poieo. Those who poieo lawlessness. And it's interesting that poieo is usually connected with good and righteousness and, and that kind of emphasis. And here it's connected with lawlessness. And I want to give you several ideas on it. Number one, state of poieo. Well, we talked about that before. I know. See, the emphasis is not on what you do. The emphasis is on who you are. See, the word poieo is not an emphasis on the word, on what, what is accomplished, uh, not, in, uh, not the action of the deed. The, the word poieo is a focus on where it comes from. In other words, it's the word that's used for trees bearing fruit, okay? So it's not about the fruit, but it's about the nature of the tree that causes it to bear the particular fruit that it bears. So the condemnation is not on the fruit. The condemnation is on the nature of the tree. That's here. So what's the problem with a tear? Well, we discussed that with you. Tear, by definition, is uh, from the Talmud, which is a Hebrew thing, is a wheat. It's planted as a good wheat, but in the process of growth, there is a twisting poisoning, poisoning that goes on within it. And by the time it's full grown, it is fully poisonous. So it looks like a wheat, It it was a wheat, but it's a wheat that becomes bad. In other words, again, the emphasis is not on the bad thing that the tear did. The emphasis is upon the condition of the inner heart and state of the tear itself. That is the emphasis of this idea of practice. So I want to encourage you tonight not to focus on what you do but look at who you are in your inner nature that's really significant now in light of that go to this next idea the showing the state of the poieo the showing of the poieo well, you just said that doing wasn't the emphasis. It's the what you are inside. That's true. But what you are inside always shows itself. Again, the idea of trees bearing fruit. Trees will bear fruit, all things being equal. So there will be a showing of what you are inside. Um, remember the story? Uh, there was this preacher that came to... a. Uh, chapel in uh is actually where it came from he was speaking in a chapel in um 
in college to his college students. And he came down out of the pulpit and stood down in front of the pulpit and he had in his hand a glass of water. And he called a, a student up and said, I want you to come up here. And of course the student did. And he said, I want you to put one hand here and one hand here. And she did. And he said, uh, my instructions to you are to, is to shake my arm. And she looked at him strangely. He said, it's okay, just shake my arm. And she began gently to shake his arm and a little water spilled out. He said, no, shake my arm, really shake my arm. So she began to really shake his arm. And of course, water was spilling everywhere all over the front. And when she got done, there was very little water in. And uh, he finally stopped her and he said, uh, now I wanna ask you a question. Uh, why did water spill out of the glass? And she said, well, uh, uh, because I shook your arm. And he said, no, that's not why water spilled out of the glass. Why did water spill out of the glass? Not because you shook my arm. Oh, she said, because water was in the glass. See, if milk would have been in the glass, it would have spilled out. If lemonade had been in the glass, it would have spilled out. See, the shaking didn't have anything to do with what spilled out. See, I bump you, and something just, whoa! Where did that come from? Well, you made me do it. No, I didn't. That was in you all the time. And I just shook you a little bit. And, and what you are inside reveals itself. And see, you can say, well, I was fine until we moved here. Well... Like we created this? We didn't create this. In fact, you should come up, if I bump you and, whoa, you should come up to me and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for being used of God to reveal what I'm like. Because what you are inside will reveal itself. C.S. Lewis uses the illustration of, of uh, the basement, you know. You come into the house and stomp down the stairs and look around and say, hey, there's no rats down here. Well, don't do that. <coughs> Tiptoe into the house. Carefully open the basement door. Tiptoe down the stairs. Sneak over. Flip the lights on, there's rats! <laughs> They're scattering! <laughs> when do you see rats? <laughs> you know, we look at our lives, oh, no rats here. Hey, what you are in the spontaneous moments, what you are when you don't think about it, what you are when you just react, Don't say, well, I'm not like that. Well, that was just, that was just an off moment. <laughs> no, that's a revelation of who you are. Would you deal with that? Would you deal with that? Because what you are within is going to show itself. And I found out you can only bottle yourself up so long. You can only count to ten so many times. You can only bite your lip and have so many stitches. Sometime, someplace, who you are will express itself. See, I believe the Bible tells us you can have an encounter with Jesus that will change the very inner nature of your being. You can be filled with him. And then I can bump you and all I'm going to get out of you is Jesus because that's all you got in you. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Jesus, I want you in my life like that. 
I'm sick of living with the guard up. And I'm sick of living and trying to master myself. And I'm sick of anger management classes. I'm, I'm tired of all that, God. I'd like to really be so full of you that in every situation when I think about it, when I don't think about it, when I'm caught off guard, hey, you just spill out of me because it's just who I am. And Lord, if there's any chance at all, you can do that in my life. I want to give you the chance. Because if I understand what's going on, uh, we live in a time period and we're moving towards another period of existence. And some of us believe it's coming real quick. And this is not about straightening my act. This is not about getting my act together. This is not about this is about you and me and such an intimate relationship with you that what spills out of me is you and not me. And you're the only shot I got at that. In this moment of time, could we make choices and respond in light of the long-range view and allow you to do something deep within us. Heads are bowed. Uh, hey, this is not a finger in your face. This is not a bawling out. This is not putting you down. But you don't have to be like you are. You don't have to contribute to the lawlessness. You can be who you ought to be. But it'll take Jesus to get it done. Oh, would you let him do that in your life tonight? Would you allow him to invade you? No covering. No excusing just responding, just openness. Moments of seeking. Moments of seeking. Want to pray with me?